I realized that what I was doing was doing a lot of talking, a lot of explaining, a lot of finding and fixing, and I wasn't listening. And so I started to listen more to patients and really try to get a sense of what was going on. Paging Dr. Cook. Paging Dr. Cook. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Welcome to the Prescription for Success podcast with your host, Dr. Randy Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prescription for Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Randy Cook. As always, I want to remind everyone that our podcast is made possible by MD Coaches, providing leadership and executive coaching for physicians by physicians to overcome burnout, transition your career, develop as a leader, or whatever your goal might be. Visit MD Coaches on the web at mymdcoaches.com because you're not in this alone. Well, my guest today recently retired after a 41-year career as a neurologist with Northern California Kaiser Permanente. But throughout his career, he's had a passionate interest in how we communicate as humans. He's written extensively on that subject for the Kaiser Monthly Newsletter, and several of his essays have been published in widely circulated medical journals. I really enjoyed speaking with a fellow coach, so let's hear my conversation with Dr. Scott Abramson. And I am really delighted to be speaking today with uh, Dr. Scott Abramson out in the western area of the United States. We don't have many West Coasters on the show, but uh, Scott, thank you so much for being with us. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Randy, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Scott, because when I look over your CV, it is abundantly evident that you and I are uh, nearly precisely in the same timeline. We started our medical career at nearly the same time. We terminated our medical career at practically the same time. Uh, We have seen the evolution. We have seen it through rather different lenses. I have always been in private practice. You, on the other hand, have been in managed care. Right. We witnessed the changes, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to getting your take on that. But as always, I want to begin with your beginnings. And I'm curious, I've listened to some of your YouTube videos, and I get a little bit of a Southern accent, and I'm wondering if maybe you had your origins in the South like I did. Actually, yeah, Randy. I was born in Des Moines, Iowa. My father was a traveling vacuum salesman. Uh, no kidding. The, yeah. The that Ace that Electro- is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. He sold the Ace Electrolux vacuum cleaner. And, uh, Incredible. Yeah. This was back in the 40s. And, the, you know, the cool thing was is that back in Iowa in the 1940s, when he sold the first Electrolux vacuum cleaner, two-thirds of rural Iowa didn't have electricity. But that didn't stop dad because, you know, he believed in this Electrolux vacuum cleaner and he believed in the eventual electrification of rural Iowa and he became a successful salesman. And, and, you know, to me, Randy, I I think as physicians, we are also salesmen, salespeople. You know, we're all selling something. Maybe it's a product. Maybe it's a, a lifestyle. Maybe it's an idea or maybe it's just trust in ourselves. So yeah. we're all selling something. And, and that's really, and that's what my dad was selling. And I asked him once, I said, dad, because I, I had jobs selling men's clothes and stuff in, in high school. And I said, dad, what's the secret of selling? He said, whatever I sold, I always believed it was the best. That's good I advice. I believed it was the best. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice for him and good advice for a physician. Yeah. So when I was uh, two years old, we moved to Boston. And then in, when I was four years old, we moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And that's where I grew up. Wow. That's a lot of moving around. And was, and, and was your dad still selling vacuum cleaners across all that, or did things change? He, he uh, got into some other kind of businesses, you know. 
basically he was a salesman all his life. Sure, yeah. Well, he must have been uh, intent that you would be well-educated because you got your uh, primary education at Georgia Military Academy, which is a rather esteemed school in the South. Uh, was that, I mean, was that largely his decision or did you have some input into that or how did that come about? Yeah, Randy, it was kind of interesting. I, and you're right, Georgia Military Academy, now it's called Woodward Academy, but it really was a fantastic place. It was, I studied more in GMA from the seventh to the 12th grade than I did in college, than I did in medical school, than I did in any place else. That was the environment there. But in terms of your inspiration to go to medical school, did that have its beginning when you were at GMA or was it a plan when you were six years old? What, what was that all about? Well, Randy, I, I think I was probably about 15 or 16 minutes into the womb where (laughs) that decision was made. And I think it was, you know, several factors. You know, number one is my father, who I told you, you know, grew he grew up in the school of hard knocks. He left home when he was 13 and he made his way in the world. And and he and the word Yeah. And the thing that I always heard from my father is, you know, don't beat your brains out like me. Don't beat your brains out. Get a profession, you know, right. be a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, something. The thing that echoed it was don't be like me. Don't re- beat your brains out. And of course, I mean, I love my father. I'd like to be like him in so many ways. But I guess so that was, I think, one factor. And the other thing, of course, in, in Jewish culture, you know, one of the highest callings is to be a doctor. And, and I think that was the yeah. influence of that. Uh, there was no one in my family was a doctor. And I'll also admit something else to you. I remember a while ago, I was at some workshop and they asked people to draw a picture of why they went into medicine and not to think about it, but just draw the first stuff that came into your mind. And so what I ended up drawing, I drew myself as a teenager, and I had acne and pimples, and I was this short, little, scrawny, you know, teenager. And then in the next, and then right next to me was this big football player with a helmet and everything, and his name was Biff. And then right next to us was this very pretty little girl. And out of her mouth came a a speech bubble, and the speech bubble said something like, yes, Biff, you are big and strong and handsome, but I think I like Scott because he's going to be a doctor. Oh, wow. That's a great <laughs> story. That's a so, great story. So, you know, I think that that things like that, the, the prestige of being a doctor, especially, you know, someone who was kind of not the coolest kid in his class was was appealing to me. Plus, you know, everybody, I think, has this urge in them to make the world a better place, to help people, to receive people's gratitude, you know, for what you do. Sure. So I think all those things were at play. And then to advance the story, your college education came at Cornell University. Cornell is a very reputable place. So I gather that your scholastic performance at GMA must have been pretty good. Did anything uh, happen at Cornell to change your mind or make you wonder if you'd made the right choice? Or did you just keep forging ahead because you knew where you were headed? Randy, I tell you, Throughout medical school and college, it was it was a struggle for me mentally because the things that were going on is that on the one hand, you know, I had this path set out for me for a lot of these reasons. But on the other hand, I was kind of rebelling against this path. I remember Natalie Newman was on your show and she's talked about, you know, a lot of us have the straight arrow path to medicine, but yeah. a lot of us has broken arrow paths. And she was yeah. broken arrow. And I really appreciated that. But I was kind of straight arrow and I felt myself on this treadmill that, you know, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for me? Am I doing this for my father? Am I doing, why was I doing all this? And it was a, it was a real sort of, you know, crisis of identity. And this went on through college and through medical school. And it was difficult because I, I had these ambivalencies in, uh, going on, these conundrums that, that I was dealing with. Yet at the same time, I knew uh, what I knew I had to learn the stuff and I was competitive and I didn't want to look stupid. So I did have to perform, but it was this kind of performance that I, I wasn't sure how much of 
my heart was in it. That's very interesting. And then when you returned to Georgia, to the picturesque Augusta, Georgia, for uh, medical school at MCG, where I arrived at MCG, by the way, for my residency about two years after you left. Right, right. But when you actually found yourself in medical school, really in the final preparations for these plans that you'd been making for decades, did you still have that angst or did you begin to settle at all? No, it, I was not settled at all. It was even worse in Augusta because I didn't like being in Augusta. You know, I'd been at Cornell and I thought, man, I'd really, and I, I wanted to go to medical school in, you know, Boston or, you know, New York, someplace or that, but it was really competitive at the time and I, I sure. wasn't able to get in there. So I did go to, and I didn't like being in Augusta and, and then all these things were, were going on. And basically I had a very undistinguished career there. Like I said, I, I didn't want to look stupid. I was competitive. So I did the work, but it wasn't with passion. It wasn't with heart. Sure. But you got the job done. And and then on to a residency at Beth Israel in New York City. Did you feel more at home there? Boy, I tell you, it was so exciting to be in New York. I just loved it there. Just the energy and the atmosphere and everything. First year, that I was there, I did a psychiatry residency. I did one year of psychiatry residency when I first got yeah, there. Yeah, and I'm a little confused about that. I'd like for you to, to 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 sort of make that a little clearer. Most people right out of medical school are in some kind of an internship. Was this intended to be like a straight psychiatry internship or what? what yeah, what the, yeah. What was the well, plan? Yeah, well, I thought that I would go into psychiatry and be a psychiatrist. Yeah. And so I did this program for one year. And I realized that I think I was going into the psychiatry more to heal myself than to heal others. Hmm. How'd you come to the decision that uh, neurology would be a good spot for you? Uh, when I was doing my uh, rotation in psychiatry that year, we did one month of neurology and I had a good uh, preceptor and it was interesting. And I kind of liked the idea that it was mostly about talking to people and examining them, coming to a conclusion and not having to rely on a lot of mechanical tests like Angela, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. so I really, that kind of appealed to me. And, and, and again, I wasn't really sold on it. I thought, you know, I'll try neurology, see what it's like. And, We'll see what happens. But I knew that I didn't want to be in psychiatry because it, it was going to be so much about my own healing and not about other people's. Hmm. It's a lot of wisdom for a young guy, I must say. Well, for a confused young guy, I would <laughs> say. <laughs> but New York was just so exciting to me. I loved, uh, I loved being there. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing, it, <laughs> it was so weird, though, because I was at the uh, Beth Israel Hospital, which is on 17th Street, and, and three blocks over is like 14th Street, and that's a street with all the people, the the, the homeless, uh, the, the mm -hmm. drug addicts, the pimps, the prostitutes, everything. And and people would come in, and we did an emergency room shift. And I remember doing the emergency room shift, and these people, these you know, from 14th Street, the drug addict, they come in, and you try to start an IV or you try to get blood, you couldn't do it. They'd say, Come, Doc, here, give me the needle. Let me do this for you. And they would find, a, they would they find it find anywhere. They would find a vein. Oh, I know. Yeah. You, I, sometimes I got to where I wouldn't even try and say, come on, you, you know where it is. You do it, you know. <laughs> That's a great story. And very interesting, those struggles of yours. Do, do you think that experience uh, has had a really informative influence on the sorts of things that you ultimately uh, wound up doing, and particularly the kind of things that you're doing now? Absolutely. You know, every experience you go through, whether it's good or bad or, or what, you know, has, a, has an influence on in making who you are. And I think that, you know, going through my own ambivalences and confusion and trouble about this is you feel you know, perhaps more compassionate toward other people that are going through the same thing. Remember medical school? You were competent, studious, hardworking, and you learned what to expect in all manner of patient care. Then reality struck. Regulations, expenses, staff management, and administration. Is this what we signed up for? Stress on the verge of burnout? No time for family or the reason we got into medicine? Helping people. What are the options when you're afraid you're in the wrong career? Transition? Teach? Quit? What if there was another way? MD coaches can help. 
We're a team of medical professionals with a century of experience in the clinical and business sides of medicine. More importantly, MD Coaches has been where you are, stressed and trying to navigate a world school didn't prepare us for. MD Coaches is your mentor, your confidant, to help you make your practice shine, navigate administrations, and successfully lead staff and projects. Or if you're ready to transition, we can help there too. MD Coaches is doctors helping doctors. Visit our website to receive a free, no-obligation consultation. Go to mymdcoaches.com forward slash rx. That's mymdcoaches.com forward slash rx. Isn't it time someone else was on your side? Don't let the business of being a doctor stop you from doing what you love. That site again? mymdcoaches.com forward slash rx. Visit us today. We'll get back to our interview in just a moment, but right now I want to tell you a little bit about Physician Outlook. If you haven't discovered this remarkable magazine, please do so very soon. It was created by physicians for physicians to showcase the intersection between clinical and non-clinical interests, whether it's writing, painting, cooking, politics, and dozens of other topics, Physician Outlook gives a physician perspective. It's available online and in print. It's really unique among physician lifestyle magazines. And like the Prescription for Success podcast, Physician Outlook amplifies the voice of any physician who has something to say. It also engages patients who still believe in physician-led, team-based care. And Prescription for Success listeners can get three months free when you enter our promo code rx for success and select the monthly option at checkout. That's a really great deal on this stunning publication. And now let's get back to today's interview. At some point, uh, you made a really big decision, and that is to move out to the other coast. And I got to think that there was either a uh, some huge struggle involved in that, or either it was complete serendipity. I'm really curious to know how that came about. Yeah. So uh, I was training back east in New York, and this was 1979. And I never heard of this place called Kaiser Permanente. But, you know, as, as you may know, Kaiser is very big on the West Coast. We're also in Hawaii, Atlanta, D.C., and so forth. So, But I had never heard of it. But it turned out a, f- a friend, at, uh, a, a colleague in my training program had gone and joined a Kaiser in Southern California the year before. So I looked into it and it turned out there was a job opening in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I looked at other jobs around, uh, you know, some private practice jobs who were open. And this just seemed like the, so much the, the best fit for me. I love the idea that we as physicians didn't have to do any part of the financial aspects. We didn't have to worry about people paying. I mean, this was a, you know, people just pay their monthly dues and they get to see the doctor. And that to me was so appealing. So this idea of joining Kaiser and being sort of taken care of with all that stuff, I can sum it up. One of my colleagues who joined Kaiser, he put it the the most succinct way that I've ever heard. He said, the reason I joined Kaiser was because I believe in effective medicine, not effective billing. I believe in effective medicine, not effective billing. And I, I mean, I don't mean to disparage anybody who's trying to make a living out there or whatever. I know it's tough. And I'm, I was just thankful. I'm grateful that I didn't have to do those battles. You know, and I know you had Robbie Pearl here. Robbie Pearl was the CEO of Kaiser. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and he just... And he's just a phenomenal person. I listened to his interview, but but in person, he his personal magnetism, charisma, and and energy just turned our, our organization around. We just, you know, we began to really feel tremendous pride in working and working for Kaiser. You know, there, there's this interesting sort of duplicitous attitude toward Kaiser Permanente, mm-hmm. and I, but because you've been part of it all of your professional life, I don't know that you're aware of it. And and I think back in the 40s when they uh, came yeah. into existence, the American Medical Association right. was just violently opposed exactly. to, to managed care. Yeah. And yet uh, Kaiser became very successful 
I have to think that uh, they couldn't have had they not been doing well by their patients. They have had their share of problems, of course, but yet they apparently are continuing to provide good care. And it sounds like that it was uh, a very satisfying experience for you. And in fact, I'm going to quote you in the little bio that you sent me for 25 years You've been passionately involved in the communication mission at Kaiser Permanente. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit more about how that got your attention and how you became, to use your words, passionately involved. Thank you for for asking that question, Randy. So I I worked at Kaiser for over 40 years, and it's kind of a quirk of uh, dates. I started in 79. I retired in 2020. So if you add it up, it's parts of six decades. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I, Ted Williams, you know, uh, he was from 1939 to 1960, four decades. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah I don't, he couldn't swing a reflex and you hammer. You beat like him. Me. Yeah, yeah I know. Right. I did. I know. <laughs> so I think that for, if it wasn't for the communication mission that Kaiser initiated, and this is another great thing about Kaiser, Kaiser said, you know, uh, this is back in the 90s, and they said, we want to, improve our communication, doctors and patients. And so they asked for volunteer doctors and volunteer doctors decided they and got together and worked with the knowledge that was there and developed workshops and courses. And basically, and it's something that is actually comes from the ground up, that it comes from the individual physicians who volunteer for this mission, who establish the programs and who deliver the programs. And so that's how it is. But how I got involved in it, it's kind of interesting to me. In the 19, in 1992, I happened to go to my first Toastmaster meeting. Now, a lot of your listeners may not know what Toastmasters is. Uh, are you familiar with it, Randy? Yeah, I am. And I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, I, I really am. And maybe you're ready to tell me, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm really fascinated to know why yeah. that caught your attention and why you decided you wanted to check out that organization. It's not something that a lot of physicians involve themselves in, right, I think. Right, right. So yeah, yeah. You no, take I, it from there. Yeah. So basically, I, I mean, I thought Toastmasters, oh, so they're going to teach how to make a toast at a wedding or something, you know? <laughs> But it, it's not, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's an organization, purely voluntary, that teaches public speaking, that teaches right. people how to speak public. But when people hear about it or know something about it, that's what they think. But it's more than that. It's about teaching people public listening. Engagement. Public listening. Yes. Because one of the exercises at Toastmasters is there'll be usually a, there'll be three people that will give a speech, a five to seven minute speech. And then they'll, each one of those persons will be assigned an evaluator. So that person listens very closely to the speech and then stands up and gives a three minute evaluation of the speech, talking what was done well, what could have been done better and so forth. So to me, it was so valuable in really teaching listening skills. And then I sort of brought that into the clinical exam room and I saw myself, I realized that what I was doing was doing a lot of talking, a lot of explaining, a lot of finding and fixing, and I wasn't listening. And so I started to listen more to patients and really try to get a sense of what was going on. And right at the same time, Kaiser launched this communication project. And so naturally I went, I took one of the workshops and then I you know, uh, watch one, do one, teach one type thing. And then I really became involved in developing programs for our group and, you know, teaching courses and so forth. But that's kind of how it came back. A tribute Toastmasters with really awakening this passion in me and then Kaiser coming up with a platform so that I could express it. Sounds like it. You think that it made you a better physician. It did. It did. Absolutely. And I I can tell you, Randy, I would have, I know I would have retired maybe, maybe 10 years, 15 years earlier if I hadn't. Yeah. So this involvement with the communication mission at uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, led you into uh, a project of coaching physicians. And I want to know more about when that started and how that started and uh, how it's affected your life. Okay. So we do a lot of different programs and there are like 
50 in, in my area, Northern California, we have like 50 different Kaiser clinics and maybe 15 or 20 hospitals. So, and each one sort of has their own way of doing things. And then we have some regional programs where we all get together. So we do a lot of different things. I mean, we have didactic things. We have, we do role plays. We have video vignettes and discuss things. I think the most effective thing we have is what we call our communication intensive. And what we do there is, is we invite th- maybe 30 doctors to an offsite and we go someplace out in the woods with a nice place, you know, where nice meals and all that forest. And, and for four days, we just do communication and we do experiential stuff. So what we will do, we work in small groups of four, maybe five, and we will have a doctor set up a scenario for himself. Like maybe he'll be something like, gosh, I really have trouble with the person asking for disability or something. We invite actors. We have actors, paid actors that come in. We set up a scenario where they will have this interaction and it will go on for maybe 30, 35 minutes. And while we're doing that, we videotape them, the interaction. As we're doing this, at certain parts along, when there's a teaching moment, we'll stop the video, we'll replay it, we'll ask the physician, you know, how did you think swings were going? What went right? What went wrong? We'll ask the actor who plays the patient, and they are so in tune and sensitive about this. We'll ask them, you know, how did you feel when he said that? And you get so much feedback. And then we get feedback from the other participants in the small group, four or five people, and plus the facilitators. Every group has a facilitator, which was me or or, or my colleagues. So this, this is one of the things we do, and it is it's an intense program. It goes on all day into the evening for four days. And it is an incredible learning experience for, for physicians. So what a great idea that is. And as I look retrospectively over my experience in medicine, when you're learning the art of physical diagnosis, you go and you see a patient, you take a history, you do a physical examination, and then you get interrogated by your superiors Mm -hmm. about what you heard in the history and did you write the, did you ask the right questions and those sorts of things and uh, did you properly uh, attempt to feel the tip of the spleen and and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, You don't really get a lot of critique typically, or at least uh, during my medical education, you don't really get uh, a lot of critique on the questions that you asked and your listening skills. And I, I, there, there's a famous study, I, I can't remember where it was published and how long about what happens in an exam room, but the average length of time between when a physician asks a question and when they interrupt the answer is like something like 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what you're talking about is the skillfulness of listening. Mm-hmm. And I have to tell you, I I had the immense pleasure and honor when I was a medical student of hearing uh, uh, lectures by the famous Dr. Tinsley Harrison. He was there in the beginning of the new era of medical education when we left behind the sort of proprietary uh, medical schools and started doing it uh, the European way. One of the things that he uh, frequently said to us was, if you will simply take the time to listen to the patient... Mm-hmm. they will give you the diagnosis at least 95% of the time. Has that been your experience? The question is a two-part. Not only will they give you the diagnosis, but do we fail the patient more often than not by simply not listening? Yeah. If you talk to doctors and you say, well, how did that, how did that visit go? How did that conversation go? Doctor will say, it was great. You know, I found out what was wrong. I, I gave a prescription for something. Uh, you know, I sent up the diabetic class. You know, doctors think they do great. but the fact is, if you actually, you know, talk to those patients, maybe about 50 percent mm. will fill the prescriptions. And right. there's this disconnect, you know, like I think George Bernard Shaw said, uh, the problem with communication is the illusion that it took place. And I think that's <laughs> what that's what happens to us. And Randy, the thing is, when you said and you're right about the study where, you know, doctors interrupt with asking questions. And the other part of that is, is we interrupt. And we don't ask the right questions. Mm-hmm. 
because what we'll ask is what, so, okay, so this started six months ago, but what, uh, what happened two weeks ago? Or you said it was the left side. Does it ever happen on the right side? So we ask those kind of questions. The questions we need to ask are questions like, what do you think is going on with this? Mm -hmm. Um, what do you fear is going on with this? How's this affecting your life? Those are the questions that we teach in our communication course. And Randy, what it comes down to is sometimes doctors are so much focused on what's the matter that we mm -hmm. forget about the real question is what matters? What matters to the patient? Yeah. And what matters to the patient may not be, gee, doc, I got this shoulder pain and everything like this, but, uh, you know, uh, maybe I need a shot or should I get an MRI? That's not what matters. What may matter to this guy is, you know, when you ask them, it's like, you know what? I can't play catch with my son. I'm going mm -hmm. through a divorce. I, I only have custody on weekends. I can't play catch with my son. And that has a huge impact on everything, right? Yeah, exactly. Because that builds connection. That builds trust. If you can build that connection by asking those questions, by listening to people, by listening to them about what really matters. And not only does that give patients the satisfaction that they're being listened to, they're being trusted, but that brings so much joy and meaning into the physician's life. Because yeah, it really it's not does. just another, it's not just another shoulder to inject. It's someone that you actually, you know, wow, man, that must be so tough not being able to play catch with your son. Oh my God. I, wow. And you, and you leave that, maybe you didn't fix the shoulder or maybe you still gave the shot, but you left that room feeling, man, we had a connection. Yeah, that is for sure where the reward is. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about one other thing before we, or at least one other thing before we get into your prescriptions for success. You've got a lot of communication programs out there, and, and you're actually continuing to do that, even though you're not in active practice and good for you for doing that. But uh, I've watched some of these uh, on YouTube. They're very insightful and very informative and very brief. People can consume a lot of these things in a relatively short period of time. But you cite two of your favorites, and one that I would really like to hear you expound upon is the one entitled, all the wisdom we need can be found in country music. <laughs> What's the story behind that one? Oh, wow. So that's a talk that I'm preparing. I and see. I, there's not a video of that, but that's a talk that I'm preparing in the process, actually. Of that's why I haven't been able to find it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've been exactly. searching everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so let me give you a taste of that, of what it's about. So, Please do. Okay. So do you remember the song by Kenny Rogers called The Gambler? Oh, yeah. Okay. A great song. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, my friend. That's right. You got to know when to <laughs> hold them. You got to know when to fold them. Because every gambler knows that every hand's a winner and every hand's a loser. So think about that wisdom. Every hand's a winner. Every hand's a loser. And you, if you bring that attitude, into your medical practice. So someone comes in and you're looking at your schedule, go, oh my God, another dizzy patient, another chronic tension headache. Oh man, another hurting all over patient. Oh my God. So you can, you, you know, that you can have, you can play it as a losing hand or you can play it as a winning hand. And you can say to that person, you know, wow, what, what, what's your biggest fear about these headaches? Well, my, my dad had a stroke. My dad had an aneurysm. Oh, I see. Wow, that's too bad. And then you get to reassure that patient that there's no aneurysm. And what better joy can there be in giving someone that bit of their life back, that they don't have to worry about a stroke or an aneurysm? So you could play that hand. You could play it as a, the same patient comes in. You can play it as a losing hand. Oh, God, another dizzy patient or a <laughs> winning hand. Wow. Let me make connection. I've made a connection with this person. Scott, I have really enjoyed this conversation, and, and I know our audience is going to as well. But we're at the point where I want to kind of turn the program entirely over to you, and we're going to pause. I'm going to close my mic, and uh, our guest will have an opportunity to listen as uh, Dr. Scott Abramson gives us his personal prescriptions for success. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. So the three things— the first thing, and, and, I, and I talked about this, the first thing is to think about it's not 
what's the matter? I mean, we have to do that. We have to find out some of the, the stuff, but it's what matters. And just like I was talking about, maybe the guy with the shoulder pain, it's not really the shoulder pain. It's, you know, not being able to play catch with his son. That's what matters. Or, or the person that comes in with a tension headache. Um, and you could spend your time, you could spend your time talking about pathophysiology of tension headaches. You could talk about stress management. You could talk about healthy sleep. You could refer him for goat yoga or whatever. But you could spend your time doing that or you could just ask, you know, what are your concerns? What are you afraid about? You know, how's this affecting your life? And so that's, I think when you do that, not only does it bring meaning and trust and connection um, and healing to a patient, but it also brings joy and meaning and healing to physicians. So that's the first thing is concentrate not on what's the matter, but on what matters. The second thing is kind of tied into that because, you know, when we focus on what matters, we learn to appreciate the mundane, the everyday stuff that we see in our patients. And I learned this. This this struck me very clearly a while ago. I saw this woman, Joanne, 38 years old. She's a housewife, uh, mother of four. And she seen me in a neurology clinic because her, she was referred because a routine MRI scan showed something really kind of a little funky on the MRI scan. But it was really nothing serious. It was nothing. It was just an incidental finding. It was, you know, harmless. It was what we call in the business a nothing oma. It was a nothing oma. And so I examined her, I talked to her, and I showed her the x-rays and everything. And I'm just about to leave the exam room, and Joanne grabs my hand. And she says, oh, doctor, she says, she said, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I was so worried. I'm so grateful to you, doctor. God bless you, doctor. Now, to be honest, this was very embarrassing for me. Because all I did was just, you know, see her for this, you know, incidental finding on the on the x-ray. But Later on, I started thinking about this and I thought to myself, you know, to Joanne, this was not nothing. This was a something. And to Joanne, this was, this was a big something. And to me, it should have been something. To me, it should have been a big something. And I, I saw a bumper sticker a while ago. And I, and I believe there's a lot of wisdom in bumper stickers, by the way. And this bumper sticker said, it's amazing how you can affect someone's life so deeply and never appreciate it. It's amazing how you can affect someone's life so deeply and never appreciate it. And I will confess to you, for much of my medical career, I've been in the category of never appreciate it. But I now understand that for Joanne, that encounter was was a life-affirming blessing. And I understand for me, that encounter should have been just as much a blessing. And so I would say to you, my colleagues, anybody who's listening out there, how many of you are in the never appreciated category? How many of us have ignored the blessings of our everyday nothing omas? So that's, that's number two. And, and these, I think these are all connected that it's, that if we concentrate on what matters, what matters, not what's the matter, if we appreciate the everyday nothing omas, that we can Come to appreciate the fact, and this is my third thing, that we are heroes, that we physicians and healers, we are heroes. And I know a lot of you guys out there probably saying, oh, no, no, that's my job. I'm just doing my job. I'm not a hero. You know, just I just taking my paycheck, you know, but it's not true. And sometimes it's hard for us to realize. And the way I can try to get this point across is by telling a story. And what happened is this happened over 35 years ago. And one Sunday evening, I was shaving, and I noticed this little dark mole on my cheek. And I had this instantaneous, horrific premonition. I knew that this was a malignant melanoma. And so I didn't say a word of this to my wife. And that night, on Sunday night, I walked up and down the Alameda shoreline. That's where we lived. I walked for hours up and down the shoreline. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to die. And who's going to come, who's going to come to my funeral? And what are they going to say at my funeral? And all this stuff. And so the next morning, I made the obligatory dermatology appointment and this appointment I knew that's going to confirm the diagnosis. So the dermatologist on call is a guy named Dr. Gary Dick. And he looked at this brown mole on my cheek. And then he reached for his instrument tray, took a small lancet to the nodule. He said, that's it, Scott. He said, it's just a little blood blister. Take care, buddy. 
patted me on the shoulder, and then he went off to the next patient because it was a busy morning for him. Now, I'm going, that was it? A blood blister? I mean, Dr. Gary Dick had just given me my life back. I, I was ready to fall on my knees and kiss the hem of his Kaiser Permanente lab coat. And the reason I tell you this is, is that it happened over 35 years ago, but I can recall it as if it were yesterday. And I remember that sudden terror of, of self-diagnosis that I looked into the mirror. And I remember walking up and down the Alameda shoreline all night, pondering, you know, the, my terminal diagnosis. And, and looking back on all this and remembering all this, here's what I wonder. On that dermatology appointment, in those few moments that so changed my life, did Dr. Gary Dick have the slightest clue of what he did for me? Did he get much satisfaction? Did he feel like a hero? I don't think he did. It was just bust a blood blister on a neurotic colleague and on to the next patient. But he should have felt like a hero. He should have felt like one because he was one to me. And the thing is, is like, like Dr. Gary Dick on that day, we, a lot of us, we may think nothing of the things we do or that we just do this mundane, ordinary nitpicking, scut puppy, blister popping stuff. It's just ordinary stuff. But we are heroes to so many people when we do that. And we should honor ourselves as heroes. And I wish Dr. Dick had. He deserved it. And so do we. So these are the three things that I can say is, is concentrating on what matters, realizing the blessings of our everyday nothing omers, and realize that we are pimple-popping heroes. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. Well, Scott, that's really terrific. Uh, I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. I, I knew it would be compelling, and I knew that uh, it would be impassioned, and you did not disappoint. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. It's uh, been a great blessing for me and will be for our audience. Before we go, I want to give you an opportunity to uh, let our audience know where we can continue to follow you because I know you have some other things going on. So whatever you want to share, whether it be, you know, the Facebook page or uh, the websites or whatever you have, please let us know right now. First of all, uh, Randy, thank you for having me on the show. Like I was telling you earlier, I, I listen to all of your podcasts. They're so great. They bring so much knowledge and awareness to, to doctors and you're really a blessing to so many in the medical community. But let me give out my personal email address. It's one word, uh, Scott Abramson, S-C-O-T-T-A-B-R-A-M-S-O-N, 1947 at gmail.com. That's my personal email. My son put me on LinkedIn, so I have a LinkedIn. But I, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter or... But you did mention with my time at Kaiser in the last, when I was involved in the communication field, for the last 20 years, every month I would write a column about communication issues and it would go out to like 10,000 Kaiser physicians that were in our place. And so some of those, I, uh, someone suggested that I should record some on video. So I did, that's what I did. Some of those pieces, those mm -hmm. over 200 pieces, some of them I recorded on video and you can find those on Dr. Wisdom. Dot net. It's just one word, Dr. D O C T O R W I S D O M, Dr. Wisdom dot net. And you can find those there. And I'm, I'm, a, I got to just say, I'm a little embarrassed. I didn't come up with this. Somebody came up with this name and I had to come up with something, Dr. Wisdom. And it sounds kind of arrogant. Oh, Dr. Wisdom, what, like Dr. Science <laughs> and everything. No, it was just, I meant it to mean like this is the wisdom that I have gained. This is stuff that I've learned from patients and staff and colleagues that people knew more than me. So I, I don't mean to sound arrogant by that title, Dr. Wisdom dot net. <sighs> I, I don't think anybody will take any arrogance from that, and, and particularly if, if they see the videos, because they really are quite informative, and uh, they're very brief. They won't cost anybody very much time at all, and I, and I, I commend that little library to uh, anybody who wants to take the time, because I think they're worth the effort. So Thanks, with man. that, let me just simply say, Dr. Scott Abramson, it has really been a pleasure. I appreciate you being here. And I think we might have you back again sometime. I, I love these conversations. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, as always, thank you all so very much for listening today. And special thanks to Ryan Jones, who composed and performs our music for us. Remember to follow us on your favorite podcast download platform 
or just visit our website at rxforsuccesspodcast.com. Reviews and five-star ratings are very helpful for us, so please add your voice. And speaking of your voice, when you visit rxforsuccesspodcast.com, we hope you'll offer your own personal prescription for success on SpeakPipe. If you do, you just might hear it played back on an upcoming show. That's all for now, so be sure to fill your prescription for success with my next episode. 